Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on our first webinar. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes, uh, and we're going to talk about rich data and how it affects your supply chain. We'll introduce our panelists, and I will introduce our panelists, but I wanted to first give you a couple housekeeping notes. We've muted all participants to ensure good audio quality. However, we do encourage your participation, and you can chat our administrators and submit questions by hovering your mouse at the bottom of your screen. You will see a chat and a Q&A button located there. We will be cognizant of your time and finish at 2.45. If we're unable to address all the questions, we'll send out the recording and all of the answers early next week. Lastly, I wanted to be sure to mention our new podcast, Wheels in Motion. We've released four episodes thus far, and we'll have a new episode addressing a new supply chain topic every month. You can find it on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts or on our website. And now I'll hand it over to Dick DeBoer to introduce himself and our panelists. Dick? Good afternoon and welcome to our first webinar. Um, the webinar is going to focus today on rich data and the importance of getting your data very clean. Uh, that ultimately will lead to cost savings initiatives that are generated through our organization and will lead to a better supply chain. Um, a little bit about my background, I've been here at Carter uh, in charge of the growth of the revenue of the organization and also uh, to drive value into the system for over nine years. Prior to that point in time, I was in uh, finance for uh, several different companies, uh, publicly traded companies, uh, 14 years in heading up companies and then the last nine years here. So a lot of lot of experience in the past. Um, with me today uh, and the council, uh, I've got uh, the two panelists will be John Wilman. Uh, John's background, nine years here at Carter also, really specializing in the milk run side of the, of the business, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the other time before, prior to joining the Carter organization, he was one of our key customers. So he's been on both sides, on the supply chain side and also within the organization here. Ross Clark is the other panelist. Ross has been with us approximately four years. He is a manager of the analyst group. Uh, and his, what, he, what he specializes in is really driving cost improvements back to our customer base. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, what we're going to do, the four topics that we're going to walk through today is really the data is going to be the key and the foundation of the discussions. Uh, after we uh, touch on the data, we're going to move into developing relevant KPIs based upon the data that you have. The third section will be the idea generation where Ross says that most of his fun starts in the idea generation ultimately, which will lead to the customer communication and proposing recommended changes uh, to the supply chain, which drives savings into the uh, supply chain itself. Just a quick item, uh, just a fun fact about Ross. Uh, Ross was part of the 2012 Olympic trials for Great Britain. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between a endurance run and also building a quality first class supply chain. So Russ, do you want to just touch a little bit on the similarities between the two? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah um, I appreciate you guys using a, a photo of me in this. So it makes me look like I'm very much in pain. <laughs> uh, nearly ended a race uh, probably there. Um, yeah, as you say, um, kind of running at a pretty high level, um, kind of ties into the supply chain um, analysis in a way. So in terms of the rich data that we're, we're, we're about to talk about, that's the training and the preparation that goes into um, training for a race or a goal, so mm -hmm. to speak. It's kind of the building block, the foundation of, of, of a plan, so to speak. And as you roll into the, uh, the KPIs, that's kind of where, where, you, where you're talking with your coach. You're basically looking at trends that you previously uh, made or experiences you had in your past races, and you're looking at ways you can improve um, into that idea generation uh, stage, which is the next one. And that's kind of where you're... You're looking at um, the tactics, so to speak. How are you gonna um, how are you gonna run your race um, that you're you're building up towards? Um, what can you do different in the past, and what can you do uh, better in the future to get your end goal? Obviously, the last bit is the fun part, so to speak, is the racing. 
um, side of it. That's kind of where we start proposing those cost saving initiatives to our customers. So it kind of comes full circle in terms of a supply chain and competing at a pretty high level as an athlete. Very good, very good. Uh, we're gonna start off with the rich data piece of this. Um, and I, John and also Ross, I'd like you to comment on this because a lot of a lot of what we do is with prospective customers. It's not necessarily at this point in time with already internal customers that we have, it's with prospective customers. And it's a data generation piece. Uh, John, would you talk a little bit about uh, your communication with the customers and obtaining that data and how much is good data, how much we may have some bad data from our customer base? Sure, so as you said, Dick, this is a very critical piece of the process. Really the initiation of this request is, how do we get a snapshot or an overview of your supply chain? And so we ask for this data, it's relevant to the manager of your supply chain. And more often than not, um, this can cause some pain points within the customer's minds itself. Where do I find that data? How is it captured? How is it manipulated, managed? Uh, how much do you need? Uh, what makes it credible or rich? So we have here as an example of kind of the, the importance of good data. You see two different samples. Really the, the short answer to this is anywhere you see a gap, uh, that's a critical data element that we would typically need from an analyst perspective. You see in the bad sample, uh, no zip code information, no SCID information, um, no dimensions, so on and so forth. So although we can start with that data and work with it initially, there's still some gaps of some data elements that are critical for an overall analysis. The good data, as you can see, is limited in the gap gaps. Uh, more information is provided, allows us to make a more educated, more accurate analysis of your specific data. Yeah, touching on that as well. Um, obviously, me and my team, uh, being in the analyst department, we're the, we're the uh, team that's receiving this data, so we see this on a day-to-day -day basis, and I echo what you say. In terms of receiving bad data, the two main points is definitely getting us the skids that are shipping and the weight, as you said, that enables us to, to basically quote or look at the data and analyze in a, in a, better, in a better way, so to speak. Absolutely. So, easing on from that. Um, in terms of the data, I kind of want to show you a slide here. So this is a this is a way that we actually get our data and kind of make it rich in a way. Um, so we have a barcode scanning software. Um, essentially, if you look at this slide, in the top right you can see a, a barcode um, with a red laser on it. And essentially, what that is, when we receive skids on our cross stocks, um, our team basically labels this, um, puts this label on the skid of freight, and it basically acts like a license plate number. So it enables us to track it from the moment it hits that dock. Um, to if it line hauls over to Laredo, so, so to speak, or even into Mexico from. So you've got the pickup, the line haul, and the delivery. So you've got all of the legs. So it gives us the visibility, it gives us the visibility of the freight as well, but it also gives the customer um, that visibility, which I know on your visits, John, that could be a massive pain point in terms of people want to see, new potential customers want to have the visibility of their freight. That's Absolutely. It's a big um, takeaway from that. And um, also you see here, there's a little fire plane. Um, so this is an additional um, uh, act, uh, fundament that we have on our uh, scanning software. Essentially, if a, if a, if a customer rings, rings in and basically says, hey, we have this hot piece of freight and we're inventory is running low for this particular line, um, we need this freight to be delivered and basically put on what we call a hot board. Um, so when, when then we get that call, um, we put that into our system. So when that um, freight hits the next dock or the first dock, we already know straight away that it's a hot freight. Um, so we need to know that we need the priority in making sure it misses this, uh, it. it connects to its next connection, so to speak. So it's a very, very good, useful tool for us to use um, both from the visibility side and also from the cross dot team as well. Um, so as we're going on to that, um, talking about that rich data, or, um, so these are some examples of the cross dock in terms of the skids that we often see. I know we're gonna talk about KPIs and the cube utilization of trailers in a bit, um, but these are some examples of some skidded freight that we often see on our cross docks. You see the picture on the left, um, it's not stackable, which is a big key. The shrink wrap is not really done really well, um, and it just it, that can increase the risk of uh, damage, damage goods, obviously, which obviously we don't want, and which obviously customers don't want either. Um, contrary to that, the middle photo you can see is a return of a container. So this is very well shrink wrapped. The risk of damage is very, very low. And one of the main takeaways from this, I love seeing freight like this come on our dock because it shows that we can actually stack that freight and basically maximize the cube utilization of trailers. On the right hand side, there's some photos here. Um, they're basically showing a trailer. Um, it's a fairly full trailer. However, you can see that all of those skids at the end of that can't be stacked, um, stacked on. Um, so we kind of, it's a wasted utilization of that trailer, which could obviously um, drive our cost as well. Um, on, the, on the bottom right picture here, this is just a, a standard example of um, maybe a supplier 
loading our trailers with freight that's heavy on the heavy on the top with us on top of the skid that you can't do that thing. So you see it starting to get crushed. So if we ever see that, our crushed up team ever sees that, we know to inform the supplier or whether it's a plant shipping that. Um, so we know to put a uh, basically a fragile label or to make it basically mark that. So everyone knows that that can't you know that can't continue. Um, so here on this slide here, this is a further on with the cube utilization and, and how we get that rich data into our, into our trailers, so to speak. You see on the left, we have a pretty well utilized trailer in terms of the stackability. However, you can see at the end there, it's probably at 65, 70 percent full. That's wasted utilization um, that we can potentially that can potentially create an opportunity for cost savings within our department and passing on to the customers. And you see the other the other trailer in the middle there. Um, it's a 70, 75, 80 percent full trailer, but you can also see the visibility of the wasted space on top of that. So. That's another, that's another thing that we often see um, when we see traders come into our dock, and that's obviously where me and my team are looking at those opportunities to pass on. And, and on the right-hand side, this is a, a trailer. It's got skid to the back of it, obviously. It's got some returnable containers in it, so that can be stacked. But you can see the volume itself is just so low. This would be a striking image to me and my team that basically there's this queues maybe 25 30%. What can we do to maybe potentially eliminate that trailer, that whole route itself, and maybe merge onto the trailer on the left and for cost saving opportunities. So, for us, from a cost, a cost saving standpoint, um, especially on the delivery routes, do our cross stock personnel get involved in the overall loading of those outbound trailers, make sure they're fully utilized? Yeah, yeah. So, in, in terms of our cross stock team, uh, we have some very, very experienced cross stock workers who've been in many, many years. So, after a while, they, they, get, um, they get used to the way they're loading trailers. They know to load, um, to load certain freight in a certain way, depending on the stops that are obviously going on around on the round trip of that route. So they're definitely very, very useful, and very knowledgeable when that freight hits the hits the um, hits the cross stop. They know where to put it, the lane to put it in, what outbound is going to, and they basically it's kind of like Tetris in a way. They're obviously going to try and uh, stack the freight and utilize the trailer as best possible. A couple of questions for you, Ross. First of all, <clears throat> the difference between good data and bad data does it affect how you put routes together? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, I say that the main the main thing that enables my team to analyze properly uh, and basically lean out the supply chain for our customers is that rich data. Um, having that information enables us to actually produce the KPIs that we're obviously going to talk about in a bit. It enables us to actually quote on on potential business. Um, it basically enables us to look at that lean um, principles of the supply chain. And actually be able to put um, the wheels in motion, so to speak, um, to come up with those ideas to, to drive down those costs. Okay. So, just to recap this first section, uh, we don't have cube data at the beginning of the prospect um, or at the beginning of the process from the customer itself. The good cube data comes from uh, the product running through our cross docks, pictures, cubes and most of that information is captured by our cross dock itself and then uploaded into yeah. um, our our software yeah. which you're analyzing. Yeah, so I'll kind of touch on that a little bit as well. Okay. So when we when we receive, so with that scanning system, when the cross dock actually receives that freight, they're actually calculating the cube of all of those trailers that you previously saw in a couple of slides. So they're basically using an algorithm with footprints based on weight as well. Um, and that basically gets pushed into our TMS system. So at midnight every night, my team is able to basically extract that information from our TMS system, put it in Excel format, and then start creating KPIs because of that. So. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, really, the next piece of this is we've identified the rich data, how we capture the rich data. Now the next step is developing relevant KPIs surrounding that data. Now the organization has a lot of KPIs that are operational, that monitors dock performance, that also monitors supplier compliance for tier twos or tier ones, as far as labeling, as far as damage, those items. What I'd like for you to do today is talk about the KPIs that you utilize within your department mm -hmm. to drive out savings. Yeah, of course, KPIs are very, very important. It's one of the first things that we obviously look at. As I say, going back to the first step, that rich data is the key, that foundation. The next step is actually the KPIs that we're able to develop because of that rich data, so to speak. Um, so if we go over to um, the next slide, you'll see um, an inbound and outbound cube um, graph. So this is a good example of using that rich data, pulling it into Excel, making a pivot chart um, to basically show those trends and start that trend analysis, which 
which obviously helps us with our idea generation along the line. So with this KPI here, we have the inbound and outbound cube. So let me explain inbound and outbound from our perspective. Inbound is essentially what all of the freight that's basically coming from mostly to the, from the suppliers into our cross dock. That's what we calculate as inbound. And outbound is normally delivering to the plants or delivering returnable uh, containers back to the suppliers. So that's, the, that's how we look at inbound and outbound queue. So we, we use this, this is one of the first KPIs we're always um, looking at as a first point of our analysis. Looking at the cubes, we can do it on a weekly or daily basis. Um, so the inbound cube here, we're obviously looking at around a 60 to 80%. We want to get to 85% is a real, um, a real key um, point for us where we know we're pretty efficient. Um, so we're looking at this. This is basically where we can look at for um, trade utilization basically to come up with those um, optimization mm -hmm. ideas along the line. So very, very important KPI that we use um, on a daily basis. Carrying on from that, so um, we use the inbound outbound cube, very, very important KPI. However, the weights as well is obviously a very important um, KPI. So we can dig into the plant supplier shipping levels as well. So we can actually just see the, the inbound outbound cube. We can actually decipher the weights of every single one of our routes and our trailers. So we can dig, dig into it from a plant level. So it could be plant one, plant two, and so forth. But we can also lend drill, drill down even further into the supplier level. So if I can see uh, the trend line for a plant is going up for a specific month, for a specific week, I can dig into that data and look at what, spe what specific supplier is shipping more for that period. And then I can go back to the customer and say, hey, I noticed an increase in this uh, supplier shipping. Is this going to be something that's uh, long term or is it short term? If it's long term, then we may, be, may need to keep closer eye on it and maybe need to reroute our routes to accommodate that um, increase in volume. Okay. Um, and obviously carrying on from that as well, we don't just look at the weight, we're obviously looking from a month to month cost standpoint as well. So that's obviously a big driving factor. I know when you're out on the road, um, the visibility, the data side of things, but obviously ultimately you get the cost control, cost control. is obviously a huge thing to, you, to yourself, John, when you're out on the road um, to potential customers. So we can actually dig in on a, on a month to month basis as well in terms of our cost. So if you look on the left here, you have a supplier, you have a plant one, so to speak, and you have the supplier one at the bottom. So we can basically see trends in terms of the cost. So most of the time, the weight is driving the cost increase or cost decrease. So on the left-hand side here, you can see from March to April, you have the orange line, which is the weight ship, and the blue bar chart is the actual transportation spend um, for, that for that plant and for that supplier. So if you see the increase here, um, that was an increase in weight. So generally speaking, at this point, if you have a weight increase, the cost is going to increase because of it. However, your efficiency in terms of the cost per 100 weight, which is the cost per 100 pounds, of shipment actually um, decreases because of that. So on the right hand side, you can see the plant two, another side of the uh, of the of the picture. Supplier two as well, similar similar graph. However, you can see from March to April, you can see the cost went down, but also the weight decreased because of it. So normally, when, when this happens, the cost behind the weight may increase because mm -hmm. you're kind of a little bit inefficient because you're shipping less, so to speak. So right. it's definitely a, a useful tool that our current customers always want to see, they want to see their cost control and they want to, they want it to be presented to them and they want it to, they want them, they want to basically understand that as well. Customers love to see trends. They want to see trends in continuous improvement and, and a graph like this shows that uh, in both facets, both with an increase and decrease in weight and the cost factors associated with it. So uh, again, Ross, thank you for that information because that helps the customer out a great deal. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's definitely a big feedback that we get um, with our customers. So. Ross, a couple of questions mm -hmm. in that previous uh, section. Uh, so these graphs, what you're looking for is inefficiencies amongst the routes, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Okay. And how many routes are you looking at per week? And um, how many changes are you making to routes based upon inefficiency sure. that you're seeing? Yeah, we roughly run around about, I think it's 400 routes on our Milcon network mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a weekly basis um, or a daily basis, shall I say. Um, so obviously a lot of routes to obviously um, dig in and a lot of opportunities potentially to, to analyze that rich data. Um, normally in terms of our route changes on a weekly basis, we're normally making around about 8 to 10% um, of our overall routes. Um, on making route changes because of inefficiencies and basically providing those cost savings ideas to our customers. So. Okay, great, great. Well, the third section is really taking the relevant KPIs and uh, generating ideas. I mean, the previous section points to where there might be problems within the milk run, cube utilization falling off. Uh, and this is very similar to uh, you know, timekeeping to looking at data during during an endurance run and how do you use that data 
as far as performance and to finish the race. So there, there's a lot of parallels here in this stuff. Comes down to Sorry. strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea generation, uh, can you kind of go through how your ideas are generated and how, how internally that you roll the process forward in that idea generation area? Yeah, sure. I mean, for the idea generation, honestly, that's probably the, the fun part for myself and my team. That's where we get to kind of freestyle with that rich data, with the KPIs where we've uh, uh, produced because of that rich data. Now we can start digging into the actual ideas that we can come up with um, to present back to the customer. So it's definitely one of the fun part of, the, of, of my role within, this, within the analyst department. Um, so if we go to a slide over here, so it's kind of taking it back to the KPIs, right, in terms right. of the, one of the first slides we showed about the KPIs, which is the cube. So in this instance here, we're actually looking at the outbound cube for one of our current customers. In this instance, um, this customer was running a route seven times a week. Um, and you can see, we looked at the outbound cube and we saw a lot of opportunity because of the cube utilization delivering out to this plant in particular. was very, very low. So if you see the red highlighted bar charts, that's where we identified um, basically trailers around 70%. You can see some of them a little bit lower than that. Split them out by every day. Um, you can see on Wednesday, um, was a, you know, the cube utilization of the trailer is pretty high. However, those other days, not so much. So this basically prompted our team to look at, well, maybe we don't need to be running this route mm -hmm. seven times a week. We need, we need to maybe run this six times a week. So we proposed that to our customer. We reduced the route from seven times a week to six times a week. And it produced, I think, around about 150,000 um, of annual savings um, for that customer. But it doesn't just stop there as well. So we're still utilizing that KPI after the fact we've implemented. So we may have reduced it from seven to six, but what's stopping us to maybe looking at cube utilization to go from six to five? And when that happens, you start seeing all, the, all of the bar charts themselves start going to that 80, 85% range, which is the overall goal. So this is just a quick example of how we kind of utilize that KPI to come up with a, a real life um, idea generation to one of our current customers. Mm -hmm. um, the next slide we're going to show you here, so I'm actually going to walk you guys through a kind of a case scenario of how uh, me and my team analyze a routing solution. So it's kind of a case scenario. So in this case, we have a customer um, that has a new supplier in, say, South Bend, Indiana, and they're shipping to, say, plant one. Um, this specific supplier is shipping four skids daily, um, at about 1,500 pounds uh, per skid, so it's about 6,000 pounds in a daily total. Um, the supplier is shipping in returnable containers, um, so we know that they're stackable in terms right. of that. So we know they have uh, returns as well. So I know I need to look at both the inbound and the outbound um, Q KPIs for all of the routes. So this particular shipment requires around about 8% of a trailer, both for the inbound and outbound. So the next stage that we would then go to is we would then look at the location, the geographic location of South Bend, Indiana. So if we go to the next slide, we can see on the map, um, South Bend, Indiana is marked there. What we do, we would then look at our closest cross stock or cross stocks around, in and around the area. So in this, in this situation, we have Anderson, which is south of South Bend, and we have Rom our Romulus cross, cross stock in Michigan, which is obviously to the northeast. So at this point, we're just trying to get a geographic um, knowledge or vision of where the supplier is and where our network may fit in. Mm -hmm. So going to a next level of that is then we're going to look at the routes that we have that service that area in and around that new supplier, so South Bend, Indiana. So we're going to, in this example here, we looked at two routes that were running in and around that area. So we have one route that's going to Elkhart, Indiana, right by South Bend. And then we have another route that's actually going to Litchfield, Michigan, and up to actually down to Niles, Michigan. So just off that um, Michigan and uh, Indiana borderline. So when we're looking at these routes, we're kind of getting that vision of, of where they are. And you can see the window times um, on these routes as well. So I know exactly where the window times are. I know how much hours of service I have on those routes um, because we obviously have the legal limits in, in transportation of 11 hours of driving mm -hmm. time and obviously 14 hours on the shift. So there's certain factors that we you start having to think about when you start getting to the nitty gritty details. So the next stage at this point, I've got my two routes that I know service the area around South Bend that would add minimal miles to the current routing. So next thing, take it back to the inbound outbound queue that we, I know we keep talking about. So we look at the inbound and outbound queue. So this is where I know I need 8% of a trailer to fit this new supplier onto one of our current routes. You can see in this example here, route one, in the blue bar charts is the inbound queue. It's clearly see it's around 90 to 95% regularly that 8% is not gonna fit. It's gonna overflow that route. So basically, we theoretically just cross it out. We go to the next route. There may be five routes, in this instance, just two routes. So in the next route, the route two, um, we have the inbound cube and the outbound cube shown on the blue and the orange line. 
you see it's around about 60%. So adding that 8% volume, it can fit perfectly on this route. It, we, we wouldn't have any overflow issues. It's a very streamlined process. So I already know route two, I move on, I check that off, I move to the next stage. The next stage is yeah. actually the, the weight. The weight. Yeah, the weight is obviously very important as well because obviously we have the, the weight restrictions on trailers. Um, so we have to look at the weight. So in this instance, we have 6,000 pounds of weight on a daily basis with this new supplier that we have to try to fit on one of our routes. We've checked the cube um, box, so to speak. We obviously need to check the weight box as well. So in this instance, adding the 6,000 pounds to this, to this specific route to, would it be an issue? Wouldn't be too heavy for the trailer? Um, so at this point, we check it off and we move on to the very next stage. So that's kind of where our analysis starts coming full circle. So at this point, this is an example of our route sheet. So this is the kind of the final internal step for us. We build the route sheet, we add the new supplier. So you can see in bold, we've added the new supplier in South End. We've assigned it a window time. So we then reach out to the supplier to confirm with the supplier, hey, can you guys um, accommodate a window time or whatever it may be? Once they confirm, that's another box chip that we know that the supplier can actually accommodate the window time that this route permits by adding it to it. So in terms of the internal sign-off, you see the box below. You have a safety signature, billing, and you have operations. So for the safety, that's basically we have an actual safety department that we have to send the routes to. And what they do is they make sure that the analyst isn't trying to push the driver too hard, so to speak, and that we're making the route legal. Mm -hmm. So we have to build in buffer times in between each of those legs that you can see on that route sheet. Um, and what the safety department is doing is making sure that we've given enough transit time for the drivers so they're not speeding or they're not still under pressure to make their next stop. So we obviously have to, have to remember that. Um, but yeah, so at this point, we get the safety sign off and then operations. That's basically making sure that the driver's been made aware that the, his route, his or her route is going to change um, and basically make sure that everyone's on board, that we have the assets in place um, to do so. So, Ross, how much time has this taken? In the beginning, you're showing the initiative versus all the way to getting the route designed and then the, the sign off. It, it really varies. And it's something that we, we have to work with is you get given a supplier like this. Um, sometimes it's easier. Sometimes you already know. After working for four years, I kind of have a memorization of, of all of our networking. Sure. Work. Straight yeah. away, I already know. When someone says to me they have a supplier in South End, I've kind of got to the point where I know the route numbers that service the area all sure. around. Sure. Um, but what, what we often find is that you could go down what we call, say, rabbit holes. You could, you could find 10 routes. You go down the, the first route to go to the first, you, the cube doesn't work. You go to the next, the next route, the cube works, but it would, the, the weight's too heavy. Or you go to the third one, you add the supplier in, but the route is too long. It's 13, oh, okay. 12, 13 sure, hours, sure. and it's not, operations maybe won't sign off on it because it's too long of a route. So it, can, it, it really varies on where the supplier is in our network. Um, but yeah, it can take time um, to do so. And, but I'd say it's, that's kind of where um, that kind of athletics background kind of helped me in this position because you're used to basically going down a route and then it doesn't work out, you have to go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, this plan didn't work. How do I go to the plan next? Just like when you're racing. Normally you might not get PR or best time every race, but then you go back to the drawing board with your coach and learn how to you know, get better and, right. and improve your next time. So that's kind of what, what that's kind of how it ties into this, uh, this, this strategy. So. Yeah. Okay, just a summary of this section. Uh, you're taking painstaking measures to uh, look at every single supplier out there, looking at the best route within your network for the supplier. Uh, we have a prospective customer, let's say, that has 100 suppliers. Uh, t tell us a little bit, well, first of all, are you going through these painstaking measures for all 100 suppliers? And approximately how long that does that take for you to get it to a quote form? Yeah, let's say with that, with that data, um, tying it back to that foundation, which enables us to get to the KPIs and the idea generation, we clean the data essentially. So we're used to getting bad data. We understand that for potential customers, they not, not, may not be able to pull the rich data that we maybe want. So we normally get the, you know, the data that they can pull, mm -hmm. and my team is essentially spending time. It's actually probably the longest part of the whole process because after that, you know, once I've once we've got that data um, cleaned, that's where that fun start, you know, that fun period starts, where we already have a, we already have knowledge straight away of what routes we might use. But the cleaning of the data does take time, but it's obviously the core of what we need to be able to get to the next stages. So yeah. we use we use different formulas to kind of drag data as well. So got it. Uh, just one follow up question. Um, let's say suppliers that don't fit. Okay. What do you do with suppliers that don't fit in your data? 
Yeah, let's say we obviously always try to uh, look at the shared meal crime network and first and foremost because it's really it truly is seen some massive cost saving opportunities. It's a very um, very unique way of driving down costs for our customers. However, sometimes the location just won't fit within our network. So we obviously do have our free PL side of um, car logistics as well. So we do provide a full service supply chain um, sort of process in terms of um, if it doesn't fit onto our milk time network. So okay. Thanks a lot. That uh, it all then translates into the customer communication. You now have an idea generated. You have to present that to the customer, get the buy-in from the customer that this is the right direction to go. Could you talk a little bit, the two of you, John and <clears throat> John, go ahead and talk a little bit about your communication with the customer and getting in front of the customer. And then Raj, you can talk a little yes. bit about that piece also. So yeah, my process really starts on the front end in terms of making sure this is a good fit for the client and that the model makes sense for everyone involved, uh, that it's truly a win-win. So a lot of painstaking work goes into the qualifying, the vetting and the communicating internally with the analyst group to make sure I've got a win. If I don't, so be it. But if I do, then my fun starts. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting or what I like to bring up with people is I, Dick mentioned I used to work for a former car or customer and uh, that mentor of mine, when he would call on me, he used to say, John, we're in business to make sure you get promoted. So this is my personal commitment to all of you that I will make sure you get promoted from <laughs> attending this, this webinar. Uh, but seriously, then on the back end, then after we've done the qualifying, we're fortunate enough to work with you as a client. Then it really comes all about continuous improvement. How can we make sure that we're doing everything we said we were going to do and more? And this comes back to, in terms of communication daily, weekly, and no worse than a quarterly business review, where we actually go through all the hard work Ross's team has done, qualifying those initiatives, signing uh, cost savings initiatives to those action items, and then proving, proving our proof, proof is in the pudding at the end by validating. So um, those are some of the ways that I get involved and I help the client from yeah, to your yeah. perspective. Yeah, no, it, it is very, very helpful. So uh, as you said, those weekly conference calls that we already have with our current customers, that we, even when we have potential customers that we onboard, we obviously commit to that. We obviously want to make sure all of those ideas that, um, that essentially my team, it's not just the ideas, it's the KPIs. So we're regularly actually presenting these KPIs to our customers. So we're making them aware of their routes. We're basically saying, hey, you're running this route, it's starting to get a little bit inefficient. We're actually giving them a heads up. We're already looking into the ways that we can maybe drive down that, um, that, that cost or maybe cancel that route and merge it onto other routes. So we're definitely presenting those KPIs, but again, it's great coming up with these ideas, but one of the most important things that I want to make sure that, that happens is that we need to make sure the customers are aware of these changes and they understand the steps that they need to do. Maybe uh, maybe a plant needs to change a window time and kind of have to present those cost savings Absolutely. and make sure they're on board as well. Right. So Can definitely a very important thing, yeah. Um, so as we're talking about the cost savings um, ideas, I always do, that's the, that's the end of the race for me. Uh, normally the painful end for me in, in terms of running. Uh, yeah, no, I, just, I won a few times, not, not too many times, <laughs> there, John. Um, but yeah, so this, uh, this is where um, we're presenting to the customer the actual cost savings. So it's actually, as you said, cost control is obviously a huge thing for customers out there. Something that you understand um, being on the road um, as much as you are. Mm -hmm. So it's actually one of the first topics that we normally actually speak about with our current customers. We go straight to the savings. So in this example here, that case scenario that I went through earlier, this is the um, the financial impact of that um, scenario. So here we present in a standardised template to all of our customers, so everyone's on board, um, everyone understands the template and understands it. Um, you know, in terms of how we're presenting it. So you can see in this situation here, we have a current state and we have a future state on the right hand side. So the current state was the route two that we ended up choosing mm -hmm. because that route fit, the 8% fitted on that route and that 6,000 pounds daily fitted on that route. So this is the cost savings for a customer that was currently running that route. Um, so they're actually spending about $144,000 a year annually on this route. And they're actually paying 100% of this trade. They were shipping 30,000 pounds worth of trade and they would have sold um, the sole uh, customer on this mm -hmm. route. In the future state, you can see in the green here, um, I've highlighted the new supplier that's been added to the future state of this route. So another customer supplier has been added to uh, another customer's route, mm -hmm. so to speak. So now they're sharing that route. The, the, the other customer is not now paying 100% of that trailer. 
they're now paying 75% of that trailer. So that annual spend in the future was actually $108,000, which is where you see the $36,000 annual cost saving. Yeah. But sharing that trailer with another customer helps you utilize that trailer better and also drive down each other's costs. Okay, good. Um, so once we've done that, we obviously have to keep track of all of these ideas. And hopefully we come up with loads and loads of ideas, but we obviously keep track of it. So we have a continuous improvement scorecard. So this is basically our scorecard to keep track of all of the ideas over the years, whether it's a year or five years, um, basically keep track of all of the ideas um, and make sure we're not revisiting ideas. But on that topic of revisiting, I do want to point out that in the yellow, um, the decline savings proposals, sometimes we come up with ideas that just can't be done from a plant level. Um, they can't change the window time. Um, or they can't reduce the frequency because of their inventory. Um, so we actually do keep track. We don't delete these off. We keep track of them because, as we all know, supply chains can actually change from a day-to-day -day basis, even a week-to-week -week basis, let alone a year-to-year -year basis. Right. So we make sure that we're going back along, along the, in the future and maybe revisit these ideas that were declined to see if they've actually got any legs in the future that they can actually be implemented in the future. So that's definitely something we look for. And you can see the green highlight where we've added in that that most recent. Yeah, I would say time. generally speaking, you've got to make sure you're buying for the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, some of these savings ideas may fall by the wayside. Right. Conversely, when you do have the buy-in and the support from all different facets of the organization, purchasing materials, finance, operations, uh, it's a win for everyone involved. So, mm -hmm. but it's tough getting that front end buy-in and making sure you've got that un unanimity. Yep, yeah, I agree. It's definitely important to John. Well, thank you very much. That that brings us to the finish line, and that is the deliverables to the client. So I think you've done a great job summarizing it today. Uh, we, you know, this whole process is about preparation, measurement, analysis, and results. And that completes the circle of deliverables back to the client. Um, we're gonna have about three, four minutes for questions. And while uh, Jessica, while you're looking at questions from the audience, I've got a question uh, right now for probably John. Um, you know, the driver shortage has been well documented out there and customers also feel very strongly about improving the environment, um, improving uh, going green. Uh, can you tell us a little bit from your perspective how the milk run supports both of those? Sure, that's a great question. It's, it's absolutely true. Uh, from the driver shortage perspective, uh, drivers like everybody else, they crave regular typical standard working hours, routine, uh, schedule they can depend upon, they want to spend time home with their families and so on and so forth. So our, typically our milk run route to the collection side, I guess the delivery side for that matter as well, are done within 10 hours. So it's a, it's a good standard day's work. Um, because it's, it's cross dock enhanced or enabled, then you also have the carbon footprint is reduced. Uh, typically, when you've got longer lengths of hauls, which are maybe our line hauls to Laredo, or it's team drivers, or so on and so forth, uh, maybe not so much. But on, in terms of the actual uh, shorter length of haul, regular routine, 10 hour routes or less, the carbon footprint is much less than as well. Yeah, I definitely think that attributes as well to why our driver turnover rate is actually so low compared to industry standards. That's as well. true. So I definitely think that's a big factor in, in the milk network for sure. Yeah. Jessica, do you? Yeah, we received a few questions throughout the webinar. I'm going to start with one that I can answer. Um, we did have a question asking if a recording of the webinar would be sent out, and the answer is yes. We're going to compile all of the questions that were submitted today, their answers, in the recorded webinar and send it out to everyone who signed up for the webinar. So thanks again for joining us. Um, we're going to run through the questions we can get through right now. Um, probably only three or four, and then we're going to send the rest out early next week. Um, so I'm going to start with a question about um, some initial wins. So what are some initial wins or low-hanging fruit that are typically discovered during an analysis or during the initial stages of implementation? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take that one, guys. So um, that's definitely something. So once we onboard a customer and we start getting um, the information through our CMS system and kind of making it rich in a way. That's kind of where um, an analyst uh, in the initial stages, their kind of eyes light up in a way because they see a lot of low hanging fruit, a lot of opportunity. So what we, one of the biggest wins that we often see when we're all onboarding new customers is um, full truckloads. So uh, a customer would be shipping previously a full truckload um, route and a full truckload volume, mm -hmm. and they think uh, at full, full truckload cost. When we actually start getting that rich data, we actually see that that full truckload that they were currently paying, for, they were previously paying for, 
is actually not a full truckload volume. We can increase the frequency to daily uh, shipments and merge it into our milk line. That's kind of where we see the biggest bang for the buck initially from a low hanging fruit perspective for new customers. So that's definitely something that when we get that rich data and we onboard a new customer, we always find there's so many opportunities within our network to drive down their costs. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Ross. So we had a question, a customer said, I'm already, or a potential customer, I guess, I'm already using dedicated milk runs. What do shared milk runs offer that my dedicated milk runs can't? Yeah, yeah John, absolutely. Um, I guess the best way to answer this question is to kind of describe or detail the differences between the two models. In a dedicated model, you're really paying for the route or the routes more so than you are the weight utilization. Obviously, weight utilization is equally critical in both modes, but more so in the shared model versus the dedicated model, whereas in the dedicated model, you may have a supplier that doesn't ship, you may have a supplier that overships, so on and so forth. You know, your utilization doesn't really come into play. In the shared model, you're sharing with the other clients on that route, and utilization means everything, both from our perspective in terms of trailer utilization, but more so with our clients that are sharing that truck because the more weight in that truck, the better your cost per hundred weight is. So I think that's yeah, I agree. pretty yeah. close. Thanks, John. <laughs> All right, I think we probably have time to do one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, the last question I'm gonna ask is, pulling this volume of information is difficult and time consuming. Is there some basic fundamental data points that you can use to start the process? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take yeah. that one. So um, I'll take that one because my team is the actual uh, the team is actually getting that data, so to speak. Um, yeah, we understand that pain point for potential customers. Getting that data, you might not have all these information that we would say, is, which we would class as rich data. But we often actually have a template that we send out to potential customers that we, they can basically try and pull their information in. But more often than not, we actually just tell them, hey, send us your data, what you have so far. Myself and my team, we've got pretty good Excel skills, so to speak. So we start using some of these long formulas that I won't go into to basically pull of this information into what we would class as a rich data template. And that's where we start our analyzing, you know, analyzing that or that RFQ process. So we understand that, you know, not everyone can pull those receivables right. and, and, and in that data, in that rich data form that we uh, that we want. But yeah, we're obviously, amount of time. yeah, 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 yeah exactly right. within a reasonable amount of time. So that's why we have a great team here. Um, in terms of uh, the analyst department to basically get that data, clean it, make it rich, and then go from there. Okay, we actually have time to do one more. So I, another question came in that I think would be a good one. So the automotive industry is looking for improved cost savings. In what ways does the collecting of this rich data benefit an OEM that's looking to improve service, reduce costs, and, and um, limit their amount of LTL usage in the US? Can a Carter analyst help with cost reduction for semi-annual to annual savings objectives? Yep, yep, I'll, I'll tell you that one again. Yeah. My department is coming up with those yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah, and if you, and if you want to take a dig? If, I, yeah, the, I mean, the only piece of this is usually OEMs have a pretty good dedicated route that's developed. So the question was specifically about OEMs. Those routes are pretty, Pretty developed already. Now we have been able to find efficiencies on the OEM side between uh, two different OEMs. It's very difficult to make sure that the business rules are developed and they're agreed to by both OEMs. So it has happened and it's currently going on right now in our network. So uh, that's just generally what's happened with the OEMs. As far as any other items that you want to comment on it, please do, Rob. Yeah, yeah, no, I say with, as you said, the OEMs we've seen that within our network, um, you know, we understand that the, the, the industry, everyone is kind of being pushed from their bosses and, and executive teams to basically drive down their costs. Um, and that's definitely something that we obviously focus most of our attention on is literally spending days on days looking at that data, looking at any possible way that we can help drive down that cost. Um, and as you said, get our new potential um, customers promotions. Maybe. That's right, <laughs> count on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. That brings us to 245, so we're gonna, we're gonna get off of here. The last slide that's on your screen, you can see contact information for all of our panelists. If you have individual questions you wanna send them, I'm sure they'd all be open into answering those. Um, you can also see our web our webpage and more information on how you can listen into our podcast. So thanks again for tuning in today and thanks guys for, for handling this or for doing this webinar. No Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.